What's going on? Black Men in White Coats Podcast. This is Dr. Clarence Lee Jr. I am super pumped to be on with you guys today um, to share my thoughts about you know being a black professional, uh, what it you know, what I think about medicine. And a little bit of my journey and my intention today pretty much is to encourage you. Number one, to think outside of the box. That would be my primary, that would be my primary intention is to help you to see outside of the box, right? And, um, you know, my second intention would be just to give you some practical tips, if medicine is what you actually want to do, if it's something that you are pressing toward in your life, I want to give you some practical tips on how you can make that happen, how you can make that a true, realistic, highly probable occurrence in your life. All right, so um, let me see. I was instructed to kind of go back and start with my story. And so, uh, just to tell you a little bit about me, I was born in Kansas City, Missouri. So this is um, Midwest. So I'm a Midwest uh, Midwest guy, but I moved around a lot in in uh, when I was younger. I moved around a ton. So my parents divorced when I was five, and as a result of uh, of that divorce my, you know, my life started to take an interesting journey. So my dad, uh, my dad was in the home till about five. He was, uh, he was a Marine, uh, got into a, a lot of trouble when he was younger, ended up going to the military, getting himself together. Uh, but once he got out, um, you know, he married my mom. Once he got out, some of those, some of his old tendencies never really went away. So the time when I was younger, when my parents were together, was a very uh, hectic and crazy time in my life. So my dad was, was, was in and out. He was still in the streets, um, you know, selling drugs or, or moving drugs and doing drugs. And just, you know, he was an alcoholic. And so, you know, every dysfunction that substance abuse can bring to you, um, that's what I saw in my house. So at a really young age, I saw, you know, stuff from anywhere from, from, you know, uh, the police coming in my house when I was younger, looking for my dad and my dad wrestling with the police. I have a very, uh, distinct memory of that. And, um, you know, my dad was a, uh, he was, he was, he was violent with my mom, um, and I have a very, very vivid memory from when I was three of my father um, just hitting my mom, you know, just, just beating her down until she was she was on the ground. And he's kind of standing over her, you know, yelling at her. And, um, you know, my mom got enough strength, you know, after five years of this to, to leave. And, you know, that was huge for us because, one, it kind of brought... Um, some normalcy to our life. It was very, depending on where my dad was at and if he had been drinking that day, that's kind of how the house, that's what was going on in the house. So you never, um, you never, I never knew for sure uh, what was going to happen when my dad was around. So sometimes it was, it was awesome. Sometimes it was cool. And then other times it was scary. So if he had been, you know, if he had been drinking, I could see the look in his eyes and he, I, you didn't know what was happening. So it was, it was a lot of unknowns when he was around. So once my once my parents divorced, some normalcy kind of came in, uh, some schedule kind of came in, and that was really important. Um, and I and I feel like a- after that time, um, my my mom started to really influence me, and so she's the one that uh, that that raised me. Um, and so you know, five years old, my parents get divorced. My dad was the the breadwinner in uh, in the house. And so that left us with cars and a house, which my mom got in the divorce, uh, but no, no kind of means to manage that. No, no kind of means to keep up with that. And so as a result, we ended up losing the house, ended up losing the cars. um, And, 
we were um, we were left with not a lot. And so from there, I saw my mom kind of build herself up from nothing. Okay, so she had put everything into this marriage. She wasn't working. She was staying at home. And she put her dreams kind of on the back burner. And then after after the divorce, I kind of started to see her go after her dream. And her dream was to become a nurse. And so she put herself through nursing school. I got to see her hustle. I got to see her grind getting through nursing school. And we came up. And so, um, you know, my mom ended up remarrying and getting divorced again. Um, and through that, we ended up moving a lot. And so, you know, I moved a ton within Kansas City when I was younger. And then um, when my mom got divorced, I moved away and I moved to uh, Atlanta, Georgia. I never forget. It was an awesome time in Atlanta. And uh, I'll tell a story about that. And then uh, I moved to to Memphis. Um, And then uh, and then from Memphis, I, I stayed there until high school. And then I went to college after that. So I did undergrad at um at two schools, actually, I was a basketball player. I'll talk a little bit about sports. I was a basketball player. Uh, so my first first place I went was Cameron University. It's in a lot in Oklahoma. I took a basketball scholarship there, and then I transferred to play at University of the Incarnate Word. It's a uh, Catholic school in San Antonio, Texas. I played basketball there. And uh, from there, I went to medical school at Drexel University, joined the Air Force, and uh, became a flight surgeon. And uh, that's how I practiced most of my career as a flight surgeon in the Air Force. Um, And then after that, I came out of the Air Force and now I practice what's called occupational medicine. It's basically primary care for work-related injuries. Um, And so I work for a large company uh, running one of their clinics as a medical director. So that is the fast, (laughs) fast, uh, fast go through. Um, So that's the overview. So I want to talk about a few things when I was younger. So after my parents got divorced, I, um, like I said, I was a new kid a lot. And so one of the first things that I learned, so if we're, we're talking about some points, one of the first thing I learned was I needed to figure out how I could connect with people because I was always the new kid. I was always a new kid and, you know, making friends was something that was really, really important to me. And I, I, I love to be liked. I like to have lots of friends. And so because I was a new kid a lot, I picked up some very valuable skills as far as relating to people. And um, so one of the main things I would say in, in that sense is, uh, you know, when you are interested in learning about other people, when you ask other people questions and you find similarities between you and the other person, it's very, very easy for you to make friends. And so the reason why I say that is because that's really, really important, especially for minorities. If you're going into medicine or you're going into a field where you might be one of the few, it's going to be very, very important. Interpersonal skills are massively important. And I think this was one of the things that helped me the most was that I was able to relate to people. I was able to make friends with people. When people like you, okay, when people like you, They look out for you. They take care of you. They do nice things for you, right? You get invited to parties. You're everybody's friend. When you are people's friends, right, it makes things a lot easier for you. So a lot of people look at credentials. They look at, um, you know, GPAs and all this stuff. And all of that is important. Trust me, all that is important. But... You know, I might be coming from left field on this, but I can only speak my truth. So I can only speak what has been valuable to me and what has helped me the most is interpersonal skills. And I learned interpersonal skills by being the new kid. And one of the main things I can tell you is try to find similarities between you make strategic strategic alliances, people that, you know, you need on your team. Find similarities between you and them. Understand how to ask them questions about themselves so that they can tell you about them. Uh, And then just genuinely be interested in other people. And as you navigate through life, that's going to that's going to pay massive dividends for you. Massive dividends. Right. So it's always a new kid. And uh, I'll, I'll, I'll talk a little bit about about race. Because it's a it's a big it's a big part of my story. So being a being a black male, growing up in the South, I had a lot. Uh, the Midwest and the South, 
uh, I had a lot of rhetoric, a lot of things people told me about who I was supposed to be, how I was supposed to be, how I was supposed to dress, what I was supposed to do, what activities I could do, what activities I couldn't do. So I had a lot of messaging that was told to me about what was supposed to be important to me. And I have to tell you, a lot of that rhetoric and a lot of the story that was told to me, uh, I found out was actually not true. And the way that I found that out was through reading history books. So when I was in the fourth grade... Fourth, fifth grade, fifth grade, I'm sorry. When I was in the fifth grade, um, I was at a school in Marietta, Georgia, and I had just moved from Kansas City, and uh, it was Black History Month. And in Kansas City, Black History Month was a big deal. We had big programming, brought speakers in. Uh, you know, we had all kind of stuff for Black History Month. But I get to this school in Marietta, Georgia, and there was no Black History Month program. In January, um, I started you know, looking around and say what we're going to do for Black History Month, because Black History Month was something that really, really mattered to me. It's uh, it was it was really cool. I loved Black History Month. So I'm a new kid. I go to a new school. There's no Black History Month program. Long story short, I start asking a bunch of questions. I'm like, why is there no Black History Month program here? I know that I'm in I'm, I'm one of the few black students here, but I think that Black History Month is important. We should have a program. So in the fifth grade, I ended up setting up a meeting with the principal of my school to start a Black History Month program at that school, okay? And the reason why I loved Black History so much is because I got to see a different option for myself. I got to see the truth about the type of people that I came from, the, the, the quality of individuals, how educated we are, the things we've been able to do in life and in the history of the world. The contributions that the Africans and African Americans have been able to make. Okay, so I learned that from books. So instead of looking on TV and listening to songs, I decided to go to Black History Month to figure out who I was. Right? And so it showed me that there were a lot of opportunities for me. So if there's young people on this, I, it behooves you to know and learn your history. Now, history is important because it, it, it shapes identity, all right? And so for me, it, uh, it shaped my identity. So it gave me a different look for who I was. So I believed that I was a, I was a scientist because I read about black scientists. I believed I could be a scientist. I, I read about black doctors. I believed I could be a doctor, right? Because I read about them, all right? And so... Um, so I started this Black History Month program in the fifth grade, and uh, yeah, I put the whole program together, and I, I think it was a, I think it was an awesome awesome thing for that school. So I started that tradition at that school. Um, so in the in the beginnings, it was books, because I didn't have the role models in my neighborhood. So my role models were virtual role models. I had virtual mentors. And that's how my eyes started to become open to what was truly possible for me. All right, so that's fifth grade. And I'm going through school. Um, I'm doing well in school. I do well in, 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 in elementary school, middle school, high school. I do well in school because I love to learn. Uh, I, I loved reading. I don't know why, but that was my thing. I liked reading. I liked learning new stuff. I love challenges. So I was the type of kid where, you know, I get excited if the teacher told me I couldn't do 100 math problems. I'd be like, oh, you think I can? Oh, OK, I'm going to show you. You know, uh, that was just the type of kid I was. So a lot of people, you know, ask me why. Why was I that type of kid? I don't know. I can't I can't really answer that. But I knew I loved to learn. And so school was fun for me. School was a challenge for me. And uh, I wanted to show everyone that just because, you know, I was black didn't mean that I couldn't do well. That didn't mean I had to do poorly. You know, it, 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 it did not mean I wasn't capable of doing well in the classroom. And so uh, I always wanted to do well and I did well. And so going through, uh, you know, through middle school, I moved. I was in it. I was in Atlanta for a while. And then we went and we moved to Memphis. 
um, after my mom's husband at the time got a job transfer, so we moved to Memphis. And so we're in Memphis, and, um, you know, I looked at all the schools we were going to and all the schools that were, you know, the options for me, and I, I ended up picking uh, East High School. And um, it was one of the, you know, my time at East was, was very life changing for me and it was very life forming. So East ended up being a, a, a pretty rough school, you know, it's in Bing Hampton, which is a, a, a tough part of Memphis. And, um, and at the end of my second year at that school, um, one of my friends was shot and killed at school. And, you know, this was a really critical moment for me. Because I knew that if I stayed at that school in the environment that I was in, I mean, we, you know, it was it was guns and drugs every day at school, every day, nonstop. I mean, I, I would show up in the morning to play basketball, and I'll talk a little bit about basketball later. I would show up in the morning early to play basketball, and when it was time for people to play, they just start pulling their guns out and telling people, "Hey, can you hold this? Can you hold this?" Uh, because they they couldn't they couldn't play with the guns and uh, on on their waist, right? And this was a this was normal. Okay, so this is this is normal every day. Uh, marijuana everywhere. So, you know, smoking weed was like the cool thing to do. You know, you go smoke weed. Um, and so after my friend got killed, I uh, I told my mom, I said, hey, you're going to have to get me out of this school or something's bad. Some bad is going to happen. I, I didn't know what that meant. I just knew that it wasn't a good place for me and I knew I needed to be somewhere else. And so here's gonna be here's the next point that I want I want you, you, you young men or everybody that's listening. Um, environment matters. Environment matters a lot. So I convinced my mom to take me down to the school board, and I talked to the president of the school board, and I said I need to get out of this school. Look at my grades. I'm a good student. I want to be able to go to one of the nicer public schools. Uh, can I do a, you know, at the time it was a minority to majority transfer. Um, and I joined what's called the optional program, which is where you took honors classes. And um, it was, uh, you know, by the grace of God, and I'm a man of faith, I'm a Christian. By the grace of God that, you know, the school board principal heard me and my mom's story and um uh, let me transfer out of that school. Then I transferred to I transferred to another school. It's called White Station, and White Station at the time was one of the best public schools in Memphis, and the optional program was exceptional. And um, you know, obviously, it was a majority school. I was one of the few uh, black males. I was one of the few black males in the optional program in the honors program, and so um, and I also play basketball. So a lot of my friends that I took classes with weren't the friends that I played basketball with. Uh, there was one other black, two other black guys on the basketball team um, that were also in honors. And so um, the reason why I tell that story is because environment matters. Sometimes you got to fight to get yourself in the right environment. And so I went for my friends um, toting guns and smoking weed to having classmates whose parents were business owners that owned businesses that I, that I went to um, and to, you know, getting to go out on my butt. My buddies, one of his dads had a boat shop. And uh, so I went from, you know, walking in the hood, you know, smelling weed and, and seeing people with guns to being able to take a boat out after school on the week, uh, during the week to go wakeboarding on the Mississippi River. And not to say that, you know, wakeboarding on the Mississippi River is cool or that you need you need money. But the idea is that my environment changed a lot. My friends changed a lot. And it opened my eyes up to other opportunities for me to do different things in life. So environment is massively important. So I think that was a pivoting point for me when I started going to that school. When I went to White Station, my friends changed, my environment changed, and my trajectory in life changed. So from there, I was a basketball player. And so, um, you know, for me, I am a believer that, you know, black folks can do anything. And whatever I relate to, I can be that. And so 
I, I was an athlete. I was a really good athlete. I loved playing basketball. My first dream was to go to the NBA. I wanted to go to the NBA. So I played basketball all throughout high school. I played in college. And um, uh, it, was, it was an awesome, awesome time for me. And basketball afforded me a lot of opportunities. Uh, but for the young folks, I want you to know, you don't have to compartmentalize yourself. Okay, so I was a basketball player, and I was a good one. And I also did well in the classroom. And so for me, that, that was not uh, uh, oxymoron, okay? That wasn't something that was uh, abnormal, okay? It was normal for me. If I could do well in the, in the classroom, I could do well in the basketball court because that was consistent with my identity. It, I, was, I was being me in both places, okay? Um, so I just want to encourage you guys, you know, open your eyes to what's really possible, what, what you can really do. And think outside of the box. So you don't have to put yourself in a box. All right. So from there, I, uh, I go to, uh, you know, I start, I start playing basketball in, in college, which was great. I got to travel a lot. Um, you know, one of the things that that taught me was time management. So I was, on, I was one of the only, actually, I was the only biology major on the basketball team. And so uh, biology, I had to do labs in undergrad. And, um, you know, I had to negotiate with my uh, with my teammates in, in college because I had to miss certain times during the day because I had to go to my lab. And again, the moral of that story is sometimes you got to fight. Sometimes you got to fight for uh, what you want. You got to you got to fight for your vision and you got to be willing to speak up and you got to be willing to speak up for yourself uh, when it's needed. And so for me, I had to speak up to my teammates and say, hey, I got a lab this, you know, it's from two to three, and I know that's our normal film time. Film time, so I'm gonna miss some film time, but I'll make it up, and I'll make up the weights time, and I'll do this extra. Uh, so, but it taught me time management. It taught me how to manage my time. We were on the road traveling, and you know, my academics were a lot tougher than my my te- my, my teammates, and so um, you know, playing sports in college helped me to manage my time. And so um, I didn't really start getting I, I didn't really start getting serious about getting into medical school um, until probably my junior year. And I'll back up really quickly. As my mom, like I said, when my parents divorced, my mom went to went to nursing school. When she got out of nursing school, it was one of the first thing that she did um, as she you know started to make her make her way up was to find me some mentors. And um, she found me some mentors, some brothers uh, that looked like me, that took me under their their wing, and they mentored me from a really young age. So around 15, 16, I was already being mentored by other uh, black doctors and uh, black surgeons. I was already scrubbing in. I scrubbed into my first, uh, uh, what was the procedure we were doing? I can't remember the exact procedure we were doing. But I think we were repairing like a liver laceration. But I, 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 I scrubbed into my first surgery at 17. Okay, and that was because I had a mentor who was the, who was a general surgeon, and it was his OR, and so he let me in there. So you know, being a doctor was always on my radar, but I wanted to play basketball. And so once I got finished playing basketball, I said, Hey, what's going to be the next thing I'm going to do? I said, I'm going to, I'm going to go to medical school. Now, getting into medical school deemed very difficult for me because it was a second thought, right? So when I got to college, my academic performance actually dropped quite a bit because um, I, I just got distracted. I was playing basketball, you know, girls everywhere, and uh, I was doing what I needed to do, but not at a level that was going to help me be competitive for medical school. Okay, so medical school ended up being uh, a difficult admission, getting admission ended up being very difficult for me. So it took me five years to get into medical school. I had to apply to medical school over 500 times. I took the MCAT five times. Okay. Um, and when I tell people that they always get it, they always get excited about the numbers and they say, Oh my gosh, you know, uh, it took you so long to get in. Why didn't you give up? And my encouragement to you is when I'm the type of person that if I see something that's true for my life, like I'm going to go after it, uh, no matter what. 
And so when I got the failure letters, when I got the, you know, the rejection letters from the medical school, and this is what I'm encouraging you to lesson from this story is this, you know, always objectify, I always objectified failure, meaning when I failed or when an application failed, right, and I didn't get accepted into the medical school, I didn't say to myself that I was a failure. Um, I said that application is what failed and I could change that application. The application was not me. The, the admissions committee did not know me. They knew the application. That's what they knew. And I could change that application. I could change the GPA. I could change that personal statement, right? I could do more extracurriculars. I could make myself more competitive, okay? So as you, medical school, is, it's competitive, all right. You know, a lot of people want to get into medical school and they don't get in the first year and that's OK. You know, that's, that's not a big deal. You just keep plugging away. Uh, so I eventually applied to a post back program at Drexel University, Drexel Pathway to Medical School. And uh, I did well that year and I got accepted into medical school the following year and started medical school. So I got through medical school. Um, Medical school deemed tough for me. You know, I failed rotations, had to take rotations over. Uh, when I got out of medical school, I failed board exams. Um, and I just, you know, I just want to encourage people. If it's the first time, if you're the first one in your family that's trying to do this, you're going to run into some roadblocks because you've never done it before. Your family hasn't done it before. You don't have somebody at home telling you how to do it. And so for me, you know, it was a tough road, but I kept plugging away because I always believed it was a true possibility for me and I always told myself it was only a matter of time. It's only a matter of time. Me getting in wasn't, me not getting in wasn't an option. I figured I was going to get in. I, I had enough faith in myself and God that I was going to be able to figure it out, um, but it was just going to be a matter of time. So I encourage you to, to hold the same thought. If you if you fail in your first attempts, it's only a matter of time. Don't you know, don't give yourself just one way. You know, try every every single way, every single option, try to improve in every single way that you can uh, to get in. And that's what I did. So coming in uh, medical school was crazy. It was a great time. Um, you know, I got linked into a, a organization called the Student National Medical Association it was a blessing for me. Um, I went and served on a national level in that organization. And um, it was awesome. I loved medical school. Coming out of medical school, um, I wanted to be a surgeon. And so first it was orthopedic surgery, then it was plastic surgery, then it was general surgery. Um, I went into general surgery right out of medical school. And after the intern year, I realized that, that lifestyle was not for me. Okay. Um, I loved being in the OR, but I didn't like the lifestyle. I didn't like the pager. I didn't like being on call. I didn't like the hours. I, you know, I, I had a child and I wanted to be in her life. And um, I wanted to do something else. So at the time, I was in the, I was in the Air Force. So I joined the Air Force right before medical school. Um, I took the Health Profession Scholarship Program because I wanted to, um, I was just trying to figure out how I was going to pay for medical school. My dad was a Marine and I, I knew he had an edge. I liked some of the things about him and I knew some of it came from the military. And so I wanted it. And so I joined and, uh, it was one of the best things I ever did. You know, Air Force was amazingly good to me. Um, and so when I got out, I went into an Air Force program, general surgery, I told my commander, I said, hey, I don't want to do it anymore. I want to do something else. He said, hey, well, there's a school of aerospace medicine. You can go to school of aerospace medicine. You can become a flight surgeon. So a flight surgeon is a, a, a physician that practices aerospace medicine. Okay, so my job in the Air Force, the Air Force taught me how to fly jets. My job was to assess the pilot's physical ability to do his job in his environment. Now, this is a very uh, specific environment. So he's doing his job at high altitudes. Very, very high altitude. So the, the unit I was in was one of the, the rarest units, one of the most elite units in the Air Force. It's a 99th Reconnaissance Squadron. We flew the U-2, which is a high altitude surveillance aircraft. So the pilots that actually fly this jet are still numbered to this day. 
So that that's how you know how many guys have actually been in this squadron to fly. And so I had the honor to being of being the flight surgeon in the, in that squadron. So to take care of those guys. Um, so the moral of that story is your journey. As long as you're pursuing your dream, opportunities are going to come to you. So I was pursuing my dream of becoming a doctor, of becoming a doctor, became a doctor, pursuing my dream of becoming a surgeon, realized I wanted to do something else, and then an awesome, awesome opportunity came up for me to become a flight surgeon. If I did not keep pushing toward you know, medicine, if I did not keep pushing toward surgery, I wouldn't have been in a position to get the offer to become a flight surgeon. So being a flight surgeon was awesome. I got to fly jets. It's amazing. It was a, it was a super cool job. I loved my job. And uh, I did that for five years. Flew all over the world. Uh, I got hundreds of hours in in, in a, a flight time. And um, you know, people say, oh, "Did they really let you fly?" Yes, I really flew. <laughs> uh, flight surgeons actually fly. Okay, so it was it was a, it was an awesome, 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 awesome job. Um, and I, I loved it. And it was it was a great thing for me. Um, so the moral of that story, the lesson in that is that always keep going after your dream. You might not have A through Z figured out, and you might want to change some things along the way. Some other opportunities might come along the way, but keep pushing towards your goal, right? And that goal might change, but keep going on that journey. Keep going on that journey because at the end of that journey is amazingness. <laughs> I just made up a word, okay? Amazingness is at the end of the journey. All right, so... Um, I get through uh, I get through my active duty time, and uh, this is with my last twist, and we're getting ready to wrap it up. But I get through my time in medical school, and um, I start looking at some other lifestyle options for myself because for me my priorities changed. First, it was being a surgeon. I wanted to be the man. That's all I wanted to do. Then I realized that I wanted to be at home. I wanted to have a specific lifestyle for myself. And so then I said, well, I want to go into a field of medicine that has the lifestyle that I want, um, where I can be at home on the weekends. I can work business hours and um, I can be the family husband and present father that I want. And um, so toward the end of my active duty time in the, in the military, in the Air Force, um, I started to ask some questions about the way medicine was practiced. So the, the, the whole system of medicine. Uh, my eyes were, 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 were open to the, the, the healthcare industry, if you will. And so this is what I want to finish up my last piece about, and this is what I'm most passionate about right now, is uh, doctors specifically understand that you work in a healthcare industry. So one of the things that I realized was after I got through medical school, I knew how to practice medicine, i.e. not kill somebody, um, but I didn't know how to run a hospital. So I'm a doctor, but I don't know what it takes to run a hospital. And, and how I actually learned this was on one of my deployments, I had to spin up my own clinic. Right. And so in the training setting, everything was already set up for me. I went into a hospital department, had already had everything, already had the supplies, already had every system that I needed. All I had to do was come and bring my knowledge, write some orders and stuff happen. When I found myself in an environment where I had to spin up the entire medical operation, then I realized there were some gaps in my education. I did not know about the healthcare industry. I knew how to practice medicine, but I did not know how to run a hospital. And when the light, then the light bulb went off in my head. Okay, light bulb went off in my head. Light bulb goes off. It says, hey, I'm a cog in a wheel. I'm a cog in the healthcare industry wheel. And I play my role as the provider. And I said to me, I said to myself, well, I want to run the hospital. If I want to make some change in the industry, I've got to be a great clinician, but also need to know the ins and outs of the industry. I need to know how policies are made. I need to know the business side. I need to know about billing. I need to know about insurance. I need to know about payers. I need to know about regulations. Right? And so I ended up going to business school. 
and uh, I went to business school. I got my MBA, and um, now I'm a proponent of physicians uh, understanding the business side of medicine, and you know, understanding that a lot of the things that in in medical school they say, oh, doctors don't do that. Those are actually really important things. Uh, so, you know, I would just encourage you guys as you get into medicine is to understand uh, that you can be an owner. Okay, you do not have to um, just be an employee. You don't have to be a, a member in a department. You can actually be an owner. Okay, and so now uh, through the work that I do, uh, I, st I started my own company. Uh, I started my own company, and I, I do I do several things. Uh, I started several companies, but um, you know I have a I have a, a personal development company now um, where I, I encourage people. So I go out and I speak. Um, I started a speaking business, speaking in the education market, uh, in the business market, uh, sharing my insights. And so uh, the lesson in that is that being a doctor doesn't mean you have to stay inside of that box. You can use that platform. Medicine is a platform and it's a huge platform. It's a platform that has, gives you a lot of credibility. In, in, in our world, so in our nation, the doctor, the physician is held in high esteem. That is a platform. And so you can parlay that platform to other things, okay? So that will give you privy, that will give you access to other, other avenues, okay? And so for me, I'm, I'm business-minded, I'm entrepreneurial, um, and so I didn't want to just have one source of income, right? I wanted to have some ownership. Again, it was lifestyle. I always wanted the lifestyle. I didn't want to be tied to a, a schedule. I didn't want to be tied um, to a call schedule. Okay, so I started my own company. I started two companies. I uh, started one company where I do mostly personal development, and then I started a medical company um, where I do medical consulting. And so... Um, I'll, I'll, I'll wrap up with, with a couple of other, other things. I left the, I left the uh, Air Force um, about four years ago, and uh, I started seeing uh, patients for, for a big company. And um, I started running one of their facilities, and my eyes got open even more to the power of the physician uh, in the industry and um, how much how much of medicine the physician has let go to other people, okay? So I just want to encourage all the young people, especially the young brothers, if you're going into medicine, you have to understand the entire industry of medicine. And when somebody tells you a doctor doesn't do that, or that's not the doctor's job, um, I want you to ask and understand what that person is doing for you. Because if you are entrepreneurial, and you want to go out and start your own practice, you're going to need to know what everybody is doing for you. So you can assess if they're doing that well or not. Right? If you have a, you know, a lot of docs, a lot of us have the mindset that that's some, somebody else is going to do that for me. Okay, so I want to encourage you. You need to know every facets of your industry. That is your industry as well. So you practice, you need to know the ins and out of the clinical practice, but you also need to know the ins and out of the industry because this is what you do. This is the field that you're in. So I just want to encourage you, know the ins and outs of, outs of medicine. Medicine is a business. It's a healthcare industry. We do a lot of good. We help lives in amazing ways. But it's also an industry, okay? And there's business people in this industry, all right? So as you look out, as you look out into the healthcare industry, you will see there's a lot of massive businesses that buy up medical groups. Or turn, turn, turn them into businesses because they're a business already, okay? So I want to I encourage you guys to understand the business side. There's a lot of good to be done in medicine, a lot of amazing good to be done. Uh, you can help a lot of people help a lot of patients. You have a lot of power as a physician and you can use that power to do a lot of good. Okay. All right, guys. And, uh, you know, I just want to leave you guys with a couple of, um, uh, a couple of other things and I'll let you go. And I hope that this has been impactful and I hope that, you know, I've, I've shared something, you've learned something from my story. Um, and I can get a little intense at times. So I apologize for that on the, on the tail end. Uh, if some moments it was intense, but I really, I'm, I'm really passionate um, about black professionals. I'm really passionate about the medical field, and I'm really passionate about uh, physicians uh, being in in 
in uh, more decision making roles outside of the clinic outside of the clinical practice uh, but also in the business and the policy of, of medicine and how things are run so um, yeah so that's my story that's my story um, you know, Dr. Clarence Lee Jr. If you want to find more about me, ClarenceLeeJr.com. Um, I've written a few books. I tell all of my story in my first book. The title of my first book is Well, My Mom Says, Stories of Persistence, Faith, and Action. So I tell my story in that book. And then my second book is titled Persist, How to Beat the Things That Make Us Quit. Um, and that's what I speak most on now is persistence. The power of persistence and resilience when it comes to going after your vision and going after your dream. So I I wanted to get a lot in today. Um, I, I hope that I brought some value to you. If you want to reach out to me, you got any other questions, um, you know, you can you can shoot me an email at clj at clarenceleejr.com. Shoot me an email, I'll hit you back. Or any of the social media platforms, Dr. Clarence Lee Jr., you can find me, YouTube, Instagram. Uh, Facebook, Twitter, I'm on all of them. Um, but we, we as black men, uh, have a rightful place in healthcare. We have a rightful place as the physician. Um, you know, for your young brother, I want you to raise your identity of yourself and understand that being a doctor is just as likely as any other field that other people, you know, might make the assumption that you're comfortable in. It's just as likely as, uh, more likely, a lot more likely than going uh, to be a professional athlete. It's a lot more likely than, than being in hip hop or a singer or entertainer. Okay, so this is a very viable option for you in your life. Increase your earning potential. Medicine is an amazing field. You can do a lot of good. It gives you access to a lot of different platforms. Right? And if you're going to pick a career, um, you know, I think medicine is a great option uh, in, in this time. Amazing option. Okay. So until next time, if he wants to have me back on, I'll be more than happy to come back on and share more. But we're, uh, we're right at about 40, 42, 43 minutes. And so um, I hope I brought you some value. And uh, let me know what you think. Reach out to me. My name is Dr. Clarence Lee Jr. And I'm a black man in a white coat. Take care.